One of my hobbies is collecting poetry. Don't write it, but I collect it. And I collect poetry with an astronomical or a space theme because I'm an astrophysicist. In the course of that research, as they say, I discovered that one James Clark Maxwell had written some poetry. There are 43 of his poems that you can find online. But when I say poetry, I think you really ought to say poetry. I'm going to read you a very short one that I think is entertaining, with apologies to the non-Scots. Uh, at the coffee break, you can ask for the translation. <laughs> Gin a body, meet a body, fly in through the air. Gin a body, hit a body, will it fly, and where? Ilka impact has its measure, nera ain hei, yet all the lads, they measure me, or at least they try. Gin a body, or gin a body, meet a body, altogether free. How they travel afterwards, we do not always see. Ilka problem has its method, by analytics high. For me, I can na any of them, but what the war am I? <laughs> I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, very well known to us. Edinburgh University Professor Emeritus, recent Nobel Laureate, Professor Peter Higgs, to talk about Maxwell's equations, the tip of an iceberg. Peter, welcome. Now, am I to do it from there? Also mic'd up here, so you can walk around if you want. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, I'm just going to talk. <clears throat> uh, well, my, my my title that uh, Jocelyn has given uh, describes Maxwell's equations as the tip of an iceberg, and uh, I'm g going to try to tell you something about that iceberg. But to, to begin, uh, going back to uh, Maxwell's equations themselves, um, <clears throat> Maxwell's electromagnetic field equations were the first fully-fledged field theory of forces. The, uh, the, the, the term field theory had been introduced uh, 20 years earlier by Faraday in a, in a paper in which he talked about magnetic fields. And uh, Maxwell uh, did what Faraday was not well equipped to do because of his lack of mathematics. He, he, he arrived at the fully fledged theory of electromagnetism. Not only was Maxwell's uh, field theory the first fully fledged field theory, it was actually, though Maxwell wasn't aware of it, the first fully fledged relativistic field theory in the current sense of the term. Um, Maxwell's uh, own thinking uh, was about space and time was still very Newtonian. Uh, absolute time and all that sort of thing. Uh, so what he thought of as a relation between different frames of reference led to the conclusion that his equations were only valid in something which was termed the luminiferous ether. But it was Einstein uh, it, 40 years later who, who put, put that right by modifying Newton's ideas and keeping Maxwell's. So that was uh, one way in which Maxwell was a pioneer of, of, of field theory, relativistic field theory. The second relativistic field theory, of course, was that of Einstein himself, the theory of gravity in 1915. 
uh, which he arrived at with, uh, well, with the knowledge of, of, of Maxwell having gone before him. Uh, I won't be talking at all about gravity, but let's just, uh, just c continue a, b a bit on the line of Maxwell's own theory into the 20th century. And in the 20th century, uh, quantum mechanics arrived uh, uh, by around 1925, uh, 60 years after Maxwell's equations. And uh, pretty soon, uh, Maxwell's theory was, was, pl was placed in a quantum mechanical framework by Dirac. Uh, and then uh, Dirac uh, also formulated a relativistic quantum mechanics of, of electrons. And the combination of, of those is known as quantum electrodynamics and was, uh, uh, it, it arrived around, around 1930. After some uh, years of, of, of difficulty in the theory with calculating higher order quantum corrections of a problem of, of infinities, around 1950, the, the theory really arrived as a, as a fully, uh, fully successful uh, quantum field theory. In fact, it's uh, uh, still, I think, the most accurate theory we have in its experimental predictions. So that's what followed on uh, Maxwell's own work in the 20th century. But now I want to turn to uh, the, the uh, subject of, of, of generalizations of Maxwell's equations and uh, the relation of, of these two other forces which were not uh, discovered until the 20th century. Um, the, uh, first of all, uh, I, I want to uh, highlight an important step in our understanding of uh, Maxwell's equations, which arose from the theorem proved in 1915 by Emmy Noether. Uh, that was the theorem which showed the connection between <coughs> symmetries in dynamics and conservation laws of mechanics. Uh, and at the time, th the known applications of Noether's theorem uh, were to space-time symmetries essentially Euclidean symmetries, whereby uh, translation symmetry gives rise to conservation of linear momentum. Uh, translation, that's translation in space. Translation in time gives rise to conservation of energy. Uh, 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 rotation symmetry gives rise to conservation of angular momentum. But that's left, left out one known conservation law. Electric charge is, was known to be conserved. It, it's built into Maxwell's equations, but, but the, 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 uh, the, the idea of conservation of electric charge goes back a long way. So what, what did that have to do with symmetry? The answer to that didn't become clear until Schrodinger around 1925, <coughs> wrote down his wave equation uh, describing the motion of a, of a charged particle in an electromagnetic field. And it then became clear that there was a new kind of symmetry involved there, which had nothing to do with, with operations in space and time. A Schrodinger wave function is a, a complex number mathematically, which in effect means there are two real numbers involved, and you can think of, uh, of them as defining a point in a two dimension, a hypothetical two dimensional diagram called an Argand diagram. And it turned out that uh, the conservation of charge was the consequence by Noether's theorem of the uh, symmetry of 
uh, uh, the quantum version of, of uh, uh, electro electromagnetic interaction under a rotation in that Argand plane where you are ro rotating the two parts of the complex number into one another. Now that's the germ of the other symmetries that, that we meet uh, later. Uh, so uh, let, let me now um, turn to the matter of, of the other forces. In the uh, 20th century, uh, it, it began to be clear that the n known classical forces uh, uh, of uh, elect electromagnetism and uh, gravity were not the whole story. Uh, first of all, the phenomenon of, of radioactivity, in particular what's called beta decay, beta radioactivity, uh, made it clear that there was a, what we now call a weak nuclear force of very short range. Uh, it looked as if it was practically a contact force between the particles involved in this process. What's more, when Rutherford and others uh, started probing the structure of the atomic nucleus, it became clear that there must also be a strong nuclear force to hold the constituents together. Uh, by uh, 1932, when uh, Chadwick discovered the neutron, it became clear that those c constituents w would be neutrons and protons. Uh, and uh, neutrons and protons turned out to be rather similar, close together in mass, the same uh, value of the spin, differing only in one having ch electric charge and the other not. But as far as the strong force was concerned, they were much the same. And Heisenberg and Ivanenko, in uh, I think it was 1932, introduced uh, uh, an extension of the kind of symmetry which underlies uh, charge conservation to uh, a bigger set of operations which, which mix the, the neutron and the proton around together into, into a bigger symmetry scheme. Uh, and th that was, went under the name of, of uh, isotopic spin. Uh, so the story of, of particle, elementary particle physics, as it, as it became known, uh, in, involved the uh, discovery of bigger and bigger uh, uh, symmetries, or at least apparent symmetries, uh, of the type, the prototype of which was the one associated with charge conservation. Uh, now, when it came to to uh, theories of the these these new forces, the, the situation wasn't very good. Uh, the, the, there was a a, a a theory of uh, the strong nuclear force, which which was n not too bad w w when the uh, separation of the particles was was fairly, fa fairly large by nuclear standards, uh, and that obeyed this new symmetry introduced by Heisenberg and Ivanenko, and that was the theory of, of the strong force, nuclear force of Yukawa and Kemmer. Uh, and it, when, when you pressed this theory hard to try to understand the properties of of protons and, and neutrons and the other particles better, it didn't work very well. The, the, the agreement with experiment was poor. The situation with the weak force was even worse. Uh, it became clear for eventually from the evidence that there were similarities between the weak force and uh, electromagnetic forces, that I I if there was a, a carrier of this force uh, like we in quantum mechanics, we speak of, of, of photon as being the carrier of the, the electromagnetic force, the photon being the, the quantum of the electromagnetic field. If, if there were such uh, a, a, a weak force mediated by, by uh, uh, particles 
of which would be spin one, uh, it, it, the particles which were the carriers of the force would have to be very, very massive because the relation in quantum mechanics is that the mass of the quantum carrying the force goes inversely as the range of the force and the, the weak force was very, very short range. But when, when people uh, tried to handle uh, uh, the quantum th field theory of uh, a, a force mediated by spin one massive particles, they got nonsense. It, it wasn't just, r it, it wasn't even wrong. You, you couldn't calculate with it because uh, once you started looking at quantum corrections, you got infinite numbers which you couldn't sweep under the carpet or, or rationalize away in the way which had been done in uh, quantum electrodynamics. Uh, so that, that for a time was, was a kind of disaster for the theory and people tended to give up on use, even trying to use, use quantum field theories in that context. Meanwhile, uh, Maxwell's equations had been generalized to th uh, field equations incorporating higher symmetries. Uh, there was a hint of it already in, in 1938 from a, in a paper by the Swedish physicist Oscar Klein, but the first uh, uh, full description of such a theory was by uh, Yang and Mills in 1954, and also in the, in the uh, unpublished PhD thesis of uh, Ron Shaw at Cambridge at the same time. Uh, the, 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 uh, it, it was, in, in terms of the theoretical construction, it was, it was straightforward enough to generalize Maxwell's equations to uh, higher symmetries for the symmetry involved in the strong interaction, uh, which was what Young Mills looked at. It involved having, having four copies of, 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 uh, of uh, sorry, uh, th uh, three copies of, of Maxwell's field, and the different kinds of field would actually interact with one another, which made it a highly nonlinear theory. But the, the big problem was that if you, if you interpreted this theory in, the, in the, the only way people knew how um, at the time, it uh, was associated with massless particles mediating the force. It, it would be a long range force, not a short range force. Uh, and so it, it was put, a, put on one side as a non-starter for many years. However, uh, uh, that was 1954. Six years later, uh, an idea was imported into, into uh, quantum field theory and elementary particle physics from the physics of condensed matter by the Japanese-born theorist Yoichiro Nambu. He had learned about the successful theory of superconductivity of Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer, 1957. And he saw that what was involved there formally was what is now known as spontaneous breaking of a, of a, of a symmetry. It, it's a kind of theory in which the, what you expect of the, of the vacuum, so-called vacuum, which is the state in which there are no particles present, as, as low an energy as you can get, the lowest energy state, the vacuum used to be assumed by most uh, particle physicists that it, it was assumed it would be totally, totally symmetric with respect to the symmetry group. But apparently in, in the superconductor, this wasn't so. Uh, and the symmetry which was spontaneously broken was actually the one associated with uh, electrodynamics. And so uh, Nambu uh, tried this ad idea out and for, uh, for symmetries in particle physics, and he got interesting uh, results. He could uh, generate masses for proton and neutron, which are still, were still then believed to be elementary, 
from scratch, as it were. They didn't, didn't appear in the underlying dynamics, but they came out in, in, in the wash in the solutions. Uh, but there was a, a big snag that the theory also involved uh, the prediction of massless, spinless particles. Uh, and th that was a disaster uh, because there aren't any. Uh, there couldn't be any if there, if there were experimentalists would have found them years ago because you don't need any th threshold energy to create them. And besides, they would be responsible for a lot of energy loss from stars, which we know is mainly electromagnetic. Uh, and so the, when a theorem was proved that this, this had to happen in Danbury's type of theory, it seemed to be uh, dead in the water. But in, in about um, 50 years ago, uh, it, it, it was discovered that there was, a, that there was a, a, a way out of this difficulty. And the way out of this difficulty was essentially uh, the c correct involvement of Maxwellian type fields. The axioms proved axiom is used to prove, prove this, this theorem about massless particles were not valid in the presence of Maxwellian fields. And so all that had to be done was to marry essentially Nambu, or the other, well, the, the British theorist who was involved in this program was Geoffrey Goldstone at Cambridge. You had to marry Nambu or Goldstone type theories involving spontaneous symmetry breaking with Maxwellian type of theories and then it worked. You got just what you wanted. You got uh, theories in, in which the quanta of, the, of, of some of the uh, fields carrying f forces uh, were massive. Uh, and in 1967, uh, Weinberg and Salam uh, were, were work, working on the basis of a proposal by uh, Glashow about the symmetry of, in weak interactions in, back in 1960. Um, uh, Glashow and Salam pr produced such a theory, which turned out uh, years later to be the experimentally successful one. Uh, uh, what's more, it was, it, was, it was discovered through the work of two Dutch theorists in um, uh, uh, around 1971-72 that the theory that built in this way was a viable one in the sense that it was as, as good as quantum electrodynamics in terms of b being a calculable theory. No, 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 nothing there, there which, which, which actually wrecked the consistency and had to be swept under the carpet in any way. So that's, that's where we arrived at. So um, what, uh, what Maxwell eventually, Maxwell's work eventually gave rise to in the um, mid and late 20th century uh, was a theory of weak and electromagnetic interactions which involved uh, a total of four Maxwellian type fields, uh, but with this spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, added in to, to, to get the masses to work. A few years later, it turned out that uh, a Maxwellian type theory could also be used for the strong interactions uh, because uh, more powerful ways of dealing with that sort of theory showed that certain uh, theories involving higher symmetry uh, would not have the behavior you expect fr from a naive uh, calculation, they, they would not give rise to a long range force, they would give rise to a confining force which, which, which keeps particles fr from escaping uh, from, a, from a composite object. By then uh, it was known that the neutron and proton etc. were not elementary, that they, that they were made of quarks and the successful theory, again a, a, a theory of Maxwellian type, is quantum chromodynamics uh, which arrived in the mid-70s, and that adds another eight Maxwellian-type fields to, to the list. So Maxwell 
uh, has spawned a lot of uh, a, a, a lot of uh, progeny in the 20th century, and uh, that's that's why I, I I'm here to celebrate the 150th anniversary of his equations. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter, for that splendid overview. We now have a few minutes for questions and answers. The procedure is, if you want to ask a question, raise a hand. I will direct a microphone to you. Please hold the microphone quite close. It's uh, like an ice cream cone. Yeah. Just don't actually lick it. <laughs> And uh, I hope we'll have time for several of those. Uh, I may, may need your years to help me hear the questions. Right, fine. So, Sir Michael. Uh, I was delighted to have your reference to Ronald Shaw. Mm. He was a great contemporary of mine at Cambridge. Mm. We played bridge together, he was a great man. And he was very sad when he wrote his thesis under Abdus Salam, uh, Abdus Salam said, you don't need to publish that because it's not really very important. So he did, <laughs> he did not publish his thesis. And he left mathematics, physics, and drifted off into the unknowns. Uh, and yet, subsequently, of course, people discovered that he had simultaneously discovered the Young Mills equations. They're trying, respectively, to give him his due, but unfortunately, time is too late. He, his supervisor advised him not to publish. <laughs> Not really, no, I, I, I did read Shaw. Okay. Yes. Are there other questions to Peter? Yes, microphone just by you. Uh, hi, Peter. Fantastic talk. Stephen Watson from Glasgow. Uh, at what point can we expect the unification of general relativity and the uh, theories that you've talked about today? It would be lovely to imagine that at some point in the future, Maxwell weds Einstein. I didn't hear that at all. What about the, when do we expect the merger of general relativity and the theories? Uh, well, well um, I probably got this one working too. I, uh, I, I can't answer that question. I mean, the, 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 um, the, 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 the theory as it, as it stands, the Einstein theory, is in the, in, in the class of, 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 seems to be in the class of theories where we can't handle the infinities in quantum theory. I mean, subsequent to the, the sort of unified theories of uh, strong and weak forces and electromagnetism and so on, uh, people went on to you know higher symmetries. And now, it's in the 70s, uh, they, they they found it, found that, that there was a promising new kind of symmetry called supersymmetry, which many people hope will turn out to be right, which predicts that, uh, that there should be. Uh, uh, sets of uh, elementary particles which are partners, supersymmetric partners of the ones we know uh, at higher energies and, and uh, the people at CERN would, would dearly like to find uh, evidence for or against that. Uh, and the, the, the supersymmetric theories had some special properties which uh, led people to think that they m might, if they were uh, extended to incorporate uh, gravity, Einstein gravity, they might cure the the problems that ha has in, in quantum theory. It turned out, as far as we know, not to be not not to work, not quite. It doesn't quite work as the way it needs to, and that uh, again tr triggered a further wave of, of theorizing, which is goes under the name of of, of string theory on superstring theory, where uh, people formulate theories uh, which, uh, which avoid the difficulties inherent in a lot of quantum field theories. But it's very speculative, and uh, it isn't clear what the final answer will, will be. I, I don't know what the time scale will be for solving that one. Mm -hmm. Yes, here in the front row. <coughs> so for uh, yes, I know that at CERN they're boosting the, the power of the machine uh, to higher energies and so on. 
what do you think they'll find when they, they have, have boosted it to higher, these higher energies? Well, it's, it's now running uh, close to its design energy. I mean, the, the, the discoveries which were made uh, th three, or three or more years ago were made with, with, with the machine running at only half the design energy because they were, they were worried it might, it might cr crash if they pushed it too, too hard at first. Now they're up to, to the f nearly the full design energy. Uh, as, as I mentioned, many people hope that these supersymmetric partners of the things we already know will be discovered. Uh, certainly some theorists there who have a, a big stake in that. Um, the uh, supersymmetric partners, if discovered, uh, contain things which are candidate particles for the mysterious dark matter, which con constitutes 90-something percent of mass in the universe. Um, and, well, there are likely to be surprises as well, <laughs> you know, things which we don't expect. Uh, one of the things that they are certainly going to be doing in the short term is to get a much more detailed understanding of the things, things they discovered three years ago. And may I ask a supplement, is there any um, indication of how heavy, if they find these super, how heavy supersymmetric particles are? Or do they just, just um, hope that the machine is powerful enough to find them but without any theory of exactly how heavy they are. Well, the theorists who who, who work in in this area uh, do 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 have some some predictions that which suggest that that some of the lighter ones should be within reach of the present machine. Uh, that's why they 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 hope it, it the discovery will be made to verify this simple version of simplest version of supersymmetry. Symmetry theory. Uh, on the other hand, there's, there, there are a lot of uh, more complicated versions of, of supersymmetry theory, which, which, which might be, uh, you know, uh, adapted to accommodate lack of discovery at present energies. But then, you know, that's for the distant future. I'm afraid we're going to have to move on now at this point. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Peter, for a wonderful overview and for answering some very searching questions as well. Thank you. Thank you.